All right, people, we're going to do a one-off thing. It's New Year. Happy New Year to all of you. And uh, I just have a one-off hits at New Year, and the more I prepared this yesterday, the more excited I became about what I'm about to tell you. I really appreciated Errol's message last week about but God. Whatever the situation is, there could be a but God application. I hope you have found that. But today I want to take you to a stunning passage of Scripture. You'll find it in Ephesians chapter 3. And I want to begin by reading the first section. I'll read some more a little bit later. But I want to just read to you from verse 20 and verse 21. This is what it says. I'll explain it as we go. Verse 20 says, Now to him, that is God, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask, or imagine. He can do more than that. He can do more than you ask for. He can do more than you can even imagine, according to His power that is at work within us. To Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And that's a long time, ever and ever. Amen. I want to talk to you a little bit about this beautiful passage and hopefully derive some blessing from it. Ephesians is a book that is known that many theologians will look at and say it's full of riches. It's full of great gems of truth. It's full of diamonds of beautiful, you know, tr theological truth. And if you read the book of Ephesians, you'll pick up, and he uses the word riches often, because the riches of God's word, some of them you have to seek for. Some of them you have to dig deep to find the riches of what God is saying in His Word. But there are some truths that are just everywhere. You know, there's a, there was a diamond mine up in the, the West Coast. And uh, many years ago, people walking along the beach were just picking up diamonds on the beach. There were diamonds all over the place. And it was just like free. You know, you didn't have to dig for it. There wasn't a lot of work in there. But you could walk along the beach in the old days and you could find diamonds just lying on the surface. There were riches to be found and they were easy to find, be found. They were obvious to those people who weren't even looking for them. The book of Ephesians is kind of like that. You don't have to dig too deep to find these beautiful treasures and the beautiful gems of theological and practical truth. They're all over this book. Now, this passage that I've just read to you is what they call a doxology. Now, I looked up yesterday for an accurate definition of a doxology. A doxology is an outburst of praise. A doxology is an outburst of, I just can't control my emotion. I can't control the information that I have, and I just have to express it in some way. It's a doxology related to a theology. You see, your theology will determine the measure of your ability to do doxology. When your theology gets right into your heart, not your head, it automatically will outwork its way in a statement of great praise. And that's what this section of this passage is all about. It's a doxology of praise that he can do immensely more than you can either ask or, or imagine. And because of this, he can do all these things, and he ends it with amen because that's a great way to end a doxology. And he's talking about all the wonder of God being able to do way beyond what you would ask or what you could think or even what you could imagine. God is able. And so when we look at that and we see the measure of praise that comes from Peter here as he just reminds himself of all that God is able to do. Now, that's good theology. And whenever you find good theology, there should be some outworking of a doxology. Now, let me tell you what the good theology was so you understand his doxology. Come back a couple of verses with me in this particular passage, and you'll see what I mean. This is the theology. He says this, verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family and heaven and earth derives its name. I pray that you, out of his glorious riches, there it is, glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, 
may have power together with all the saints. Here it is. Oh, man, this is awesome. How you may have power with all the saints to grasp, hold on to, how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. When you grasp that theology, because theology is the study of God, that's what it means. Theo means God, and ology is the study of God. It's uh, it just the, the wonder of God, the depth of His love, the width of His love, the, the knowledge that His love surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And then comes His doxology. He's overwhelmed. He can't control himself. He can't control the fact that this is just such an awesome theology. This is such an awesome truth that is moved from His head into His heart, and He's now expressing it through His words. Now to Him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to His power that has worked within us, to Him be glory in the church. Man, I've got to tell you, that is a great theology leading to a great doxology. Now, it says there that God is able. So that's what I've entitled today's sermon. God is able, dot, 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 dot. Because God is able to do whatever you fill in the dots. At the end of the sermon, you can go out of here and you can bring before God the things that you thought were impossible and know that God is able and you fill in the blanks because He's able to do those things. So God is able. Now, this is a key theme that runs throughout Scripture. If you have a look back at it, He's able to, not just able to, but He's able to do more than you ask or even imagine. He just keeps on giving and keeps on giving. Look at grace Grace is not a once-off event. There is grace that is stored up for you. There is grace that you may need at a particular time in your life. There is abundant grace that God is able to give to you because God is a God of, the, of more. He's able to give you more. And from wherever it comes from, there is more for you to acquire. Just think of the nation of Israel, the children of Israel. They came across the Red Sea, and God opened the Red Sea. They got to the other side and said, man. That was really impressive that God drowned the enemy and he opened the Red Sea for us. And in their mind, they're thinking, could there be more? Indeed, there was more. They walked for a couple of days in the desert. They needed water and God miraculously provided water for them. Could there be more than that? Indeed, there was more than that because now they were hungry and they wanted food and God provided for them food. And there was more. And then they came across the Amalekites, this horde of enemy. They were trying to wipe them out. And they found out that God is able to do more than they dreamed or could even ask for. God is able to do more. You know, I, I, I love that story of, of the, the five loaves and the fish. You know, and Jesus is saying to the disciples, here's a couple of loaves and here's a couple of fish. And I want you to go and feed 5,000 people. And the disciples are looking and Jesus, I'm not so sure that's going to be possible. I'm not so sure that's going to happen until they start breaking the bread. And as the disciple is walking and very, very unbelievingly, he's breaking bread, he's giving it to the people. And then there's more. And he's giving the people and there's more. And he's giving the people and there's more. And he's giving the people and there's more. And then the guy coming with the fish does exactly the same thing. There is more upon more upon more upon more. You will never be able to outgive or outreceive that which God has given or wants to give to you. Now, with that kind of theology in the back of our minds, I'm sitting thinking, how do you deal with this? On the one hand, we, we revel in it, and that's a good thing to do. But on the other hand, I, I sit with a potential for regret. Wouldn't it be sad? Wouldn't it be sad if at the end of your life, you had the regret of, man, I wish I'd done more. I, would, I wish I'd asked God for more. I wish I had dreamed more for God, because if this is true, and God is able to do above what I ask or even imagine, man, I've sold myself short. I have not asked him for what I should. Like that issue in 2 Kings chapter 13 with Elisha, and Elisha is on his deathbed, and the king of Israel comes to him. He says, Elisha, before you die, I need your help. And I have, the, I have Ahab, the king over here, and he's a, he's a miserable, the king of Aram, and he's, he's after me, and I need victory. Elisha, can you tell me what to do? How selfish is that? The guy's about to die, and he's selfishly asking. But, but Elisha says, okay, take, a, take an arrow, come to me with your arrows, take an arrow out, and shoot it out of my window. 
and he shoots the arrow out the window. Then Elisha, in a strange way, he says, now take your arrows and beat them upon the floor. And so he takes his arrows and he beats them one, two, three times. And Elisha is so angry with him because Elisha says, that's a statement of lack of faith. You're going to live to regret that because you would have had as many victories as the times that you beat your arrows upon the floor. And the king with regret is saying, you mean I could have asked for more? You mean I could have asked for more victories over Aram? And Elisha said, as many times as you hit that arrows upon the floor, you would have got victories, but you only asked for three. You only asked for three. And now you're going to live with that. And the regret of not using this beautiful promise of God being able to do more than you ask or even what you could imagine. God is able to do more than all of that. Yeah, there's a couple of key words in this particular passage. Let me share a couple with you. The first word is this immeasurably more. It's what they would call a superlative. A superlative is a word of highest acknowledgement. You know, in other versions, you'll see it says he can do exceedingly abundantly above what you ask. I think I prefer that one. Immeasurably more is really cool, and it says a lot. But exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask. Man, I like that terminology. And you can relate every, every superlative that you possibly could into this situation and say God is able to do that. He can do more than that. He's not just good, he's great. He's not just great, he's awesome. He's not just awesome, but he's infinitely, you know, you can just keep on going and never, the human language is not able to transcend the measure of who God is and what he is able to do. God, people, is very much able. Which in a sense means that I guess if it's good right now, the best is still to come. Because as much as I love the good, I want to move to the greatness of God. And I want to keep moving because there's always more and the, 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 the best actually is still yet to come. If you experience joy right now because of your faith in Christ, let me tell you, that joy can go higher. If you experience peace in Christ right now, this passage will tell you that your peace can go deeper. If you're experiencing purpose and passion, if you're experiencing that right now, now, this passage would suggest to you that there is a whole lot more that will deepen your passion and your purpose for God because God is able to do abundantly above, exceedingly above all you ask or imagine. <laughs> I love that, that thought, that passion is more intense. However high you go, God can go higher. What you're experiencing right now is but the tip of the iceberg. There's always more. Now, let's talk, talk about the second word, is this word ask. Ask, you'll either ask or imagine God is able to do more. Matthew chapter 7 is a great chapter on asking. Seek and you will find, ask and it will be given to you. To those who seek, they will find, and to those who ask, it shall be given to them. Jesus has suggested that asking is a good thing to do. He says again, he says in verse 21, whatever you ask in my name believing, you will receive. James 4 verse 2 says, you don't have because you don't ask. You don't ask. Oh, so so this, this ideal of, of just saying, well, in a sense, I get the theology that says God knows what I need, and as a heavenly father, he will provide that. I get that. I get that, and I believe that implicitly. But there are times when we come to him as we would come as a kid to his dad or his mom, and they would ask, hey, mom, can I get something out of the sweet cupboard? And mom will smile. Your mom's listening. And smile and say, yep. You can get someone out the street covered. All you had to do was ask. And we see this so beautifully with God. Then we read in Romans 8 verse 26 about the role of the Holy Spirit who's encouraging us to ask. In fact, if you don't ask, this passage suggests that the Holy Spirit is asking on your, your behalf. It says that the Holy Spirit, one of His roles is to interpret your prayer to God because your words aren't adequate and the Holy Spirit is able to, in a, in a colloquial sort of sense, say, hey, Father, let me tell you what he really means. When he's praying for this, Father, this is what he really means. And he's able to interpret your, your words that are sometimes inadequate. And God will interpret those, and the Holy Spirit will interpret those to the Father and say, this is what he's doing. And then it says that he will intercede for you. Intercede is the highest level of prayer. 
He's not just praying, Lord, bless them, that for and no more. He's, he is really interceding for you. God is praying for you. Now, this is a strange mystery. It's not that you, we pray to God. No, no, no. That's only one aspect. The Holy Spirit intercedes with groanings that cannot be uttered, it says, with a depth of passion and perseverance, and he's praying and he's asking God for you. Now, that one thought should totally blow you away. So if you don't ask, you don't receive. Now, we all know the thing about asking is we see in the Lord's Prayer, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us. Those are the four ask prayers that come out of the Lord's Prayer, where he says you can pray that he would deliver you, that he would protect you, that he would feed you, that he would, he would resist, help you to resist temptation. Those are the four asking prayers. They're all in the Lord's Prayer. But that's not limitless. That's, there's more than that. There's a whole lot more than just those aspects of asking. If you don't ask people, you don't get in many cases, other than the supernatural provision of God in other ways. But, but here's the deal. I need a good example to, to share with you here. Genesis chapter 18, I found it. Genesis 18 is the story of Abraham, and he's, uh, he's trying to rescue Lot from this place called Sodom. And uh, he said to, to Abraham, I'm going to wipe that city out. There's so much wickedness, I'm going to just wipe them out. And Abraham says, you can't do that because Lot, my nephew, is in there. And then he begins to bargain with God. He says, God, if, if I could find 50 righteous people in Sodom, would you destroy it? And God says, no, I won't destroy it for 50. God, what about 45? God says, nope, I won't destroy it for 45. What about 40? What about 35? What about 30? What about, and he gets really bold from, from five, to he's going now into the tens, increments of 10. He says, okay, if 30, you won't destroy. What about 20? God, will you destroy Sodom if I could find 20 righteous people? And God says, no, I won't. God, what about, can I really stretch, stretch him? God, what about 10? And God said, for 10 righteous people, I will not destroy Sodom. And then it stops. And you say, well, why did God stop at 10? Well, the answer to that is simply he didn't. You know, Abram stopped at 10. Abram could have gone all the way down to one righteous person being Lot, and God would have saved the city for one person. But you don't ask, you don't get. And, and, and at the end of that, I think it was great that he went from 50 to 10. I would have cut off at about 40, I guess. But he, he got it down to 10 people where he could have gone more because God is extravagant when it comes to giving grace and kindness to others. So people, don't be afraid to ask. <sighs> to ask. Let's talk about Imagine. I can't wait to get to this one. It says, not even your imagination can top what God is able to do. Now, I have, a, I have a vivid imagination. I think you kind of know a little bit about that. I have this vivid imagination. And then I read that God can do more than that. And I'm thinking, no, He can't. God could never do more than what I could imagine. The passage says, yes, He can. Even above what you can imagine, God is able to do. Now, in the Bible, there are two kinds of imaginings. The first one you find in Acts chapter 4, verse 25, where they talk about people who have vain imaginings. They have a vain, and a vain imagining is simply something where you imagine that you can get something from someone, somewhere, somehow, that you should only be getting from God. I imagine, like the golden calf, that God will be able to, uh, if I just get the golden calf, then I'll be complete. You know, and it's a vain imagining. I'm hoping to get from something, someone, somewhere, somehow, something that only God can give me. And I'm thinking that that would be a substitute for God. It's a vain imagining. 
If you are sitting there thinking today, if only I could make another million bucks, it would be really good. Or if only I could have these problems solved in my life. And thinking that that is what it's all about. You are a vain imagination person. It's a vain imagination. God is the only one that can fulfill those imaginings. Then you have what we call wild imaginings. You have vain imaginings on the one hand. Then you have wild imaginings. Recently, I got to speak to some of our Norwegian friends in, in uh, Norway, and uh, they were celebrating C.S. Lewis. Now, if you've ever read C.S. Lewis's books, I recommend you do. Mere Christianity is a great book. But he wrote some other books that are just full of wild imaginings. One of those wild imaginings is found in the book The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Have you read that book or seen the movie? And the whole thing about this particular book is there's a cupboard. And there are these kids who are in this uncle's house. It's during the war. They're, they're there. They're being cared for. When they find this wardrobe, and they open the wardrobe, and inside the wardrobe is a door. They venture through the door, and they enter into the world of wild imaginings. Man, there's stuff going on behind the door that is just re remarkable. It just blows them completely away as they're experiencing the wild imaginings of a world way beyond their own imagination. And the story is about how they find that place and what they do when they get into it. It's a great book and a great movie. You need to watch it. And so they find this place of wild <laughs> imaginings. And it's amazing. They can't wait to live in that place. You see, on the other side of the door where they came from, it was dry, it was dusty, it was disappointing and very disillusioning. It was a miserable place. But on the other side of the door, there was this place of wild imaginings. I'm going to tell you people, that is so close to the truth that I'm telling you about now. The place of spiritual wild imaginings is on the other side of the door. And on the door is this thing called, He is able to do above what you either ask or dream of or imagine. That's the sign on the door. Enter here into the world of wild imaginings. Now let me tell you about some of these wild imaginings. You can personalize them if you would like to. If you personalize the place of wild imagining on your own behalf, you've been battling with issues, attitude issues. You've been battling with with a, with a have habitual issues, with addiction issues, with, with all sorts of issues. You've been battling with them, and it's on this side of the door. But if you could just cross this door and open the door and work, walk into a place of wild imaginings, where on the other side of the door, there is a place where there is victory. There is a place where God and His passion has flooded into me, and He gives me the ability to be able to, 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 be able to impact my own life to a place that you would never be able to imagine because it's beyond that. You see, on the other side of the door, there is this victory. You've got to go there to find it. What about our church? Man, I love this church. Uh, wild imaginings for our church. I've got to tell you people, in all honesty, last year was a, a good year for us here at the church. We saw the birth of Exodus, and what a lovely ministry that is. We saw the growth of unprecedented growth of Genesis. We saw the wonder of salvation. How many baptisms did we do last year? More than we've ever done before. We moved into this beautiful sanctuary that is, is just such a blessing from God. And through the sacrifice of good people, we have now have what we have. Last year was a good, good year. And I'm asking myself, can it get better? Can it get better than last year? Ah, oh, lots of challenges, for goodness sake. Naive to think there wouldn't be. But it is, and it can get better even than last year. Please pray for us on Tuesday. Our elders are meeting, and a very group of, a very excited group of pastors and ministry leaders are meeting with the elders to discuss their dreams for this year. And I've got to tell you, elders, hold on to your hair, because we're asking for a lot. We're asking the church for a deeper commitment to take this church further than it's ever been before. We're going to be asking you to participate with us and to partner with us to a depth that you probably have never been to before, because the church is, is you 
if you didn't know that. And we're asking you to dream with us to a church that will be so impactful in this community and around the world, a church that is powerful, a church that is passionate, a a church that fulfills its purpose and its mandate, a church that is united. People, don't sweat this more stuff. Let's be united. A church that is focused, a church that where there are no walls. We hate walls. Where there are no barriers between genders and cultures and colors and and types of people, man, there, there, there must never be any barriers. A church that is ruled by love, and you're saying, Trevor, that's idealistic. You're never going to get that. Well, watch what God is doing, because God will do, because He's able to do way above what we ask or even imagine. And then ultimately, we, we have heaven. You know, it's a place of, of way imaginings. We celebrate the fact that 10 of our members have gone there just this last month. And I guess it's, a, it's amazing because it's out of this world. Uh, it's out, of, out of this world, man. Where 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has prepared for those who love Him. If you can just imagine heaven, multiply that by infinity and you still won't be close to the wonder of this glorious place we call heaven because God is able to do over and above anything we ask or dream. I want to just paint a little picture for you here uh, as it relates to the word is able. God is able, able. Now, in our faith journey, listen to the facts here. In our faith journey, we all know that God is able or God Let's say this, God can. There's nothing that God cannot do. And for many people, that's just an academic ascent to what we read in the Bible. There's nothing that God cannot do. God can. He is able, and this verse implies strongly that this is the case. But then the, the, the grounding of our faith, as much as God can, grows to God will. It's a higher level of faith than God can, God will. And so we go through th- to challenges in life, and we say, I know God can. Now my faith is strong enough to say, God is going to do something. God will do this. And then it's, it's kind of like when Jesus stood at the tomb of Lazarus, and they, he said, roll the stone away. And the guy said, no, Jesus, that's not a good idea. And God says, if you, Jesus said to him, if you will roll a stone away, you will see the glory of God. Because not only am I able or can I, but I will show you the glory of God if you just roll the stone away. And we all know what took place of that. God is able and he will. And then we reach the last one where God has. God has. This is a declaration of faith that even though I have not received from God, I know that it's in the pipeline. He has already begun to answer my prayer. God has. Done. Like the centurion who came to Jesus and said to Jesus, Jesus, I have a great servant. He's at home. He's dying. Jesus, can you heal him? And Jesus said, yep, I'll come to your house. He said, don't bother. Just say the word, and I believe he'll be healed. And right there, standing there, Jesus healed the man before the guy got home, and he found out that God had already healed him before he got back to his house. God has done it. Those three levels of faith. But as I began to think about this, I thought, no, that's not entirely true. Because God can, but his will will determine whether he will. So in between here, we have God's will needs to be applied. We all know he can. But in order for us to get to God will, he has to be God's, has to be willing to do it. Now, there are criteria. Sometimes God, because he's God, knows that certain things you don't need or certain things are not going to be good for you. And as much as you may ask, you don't get because it's not the will of God. That's another sermon altogether. But in order for God who can to be God who will, God has to be willing. But now down the bottom here, I was looking at this thing of being able being able. Is there a higher level that God has? And I think it is. And it's the same level at the beginning. God can even when he doesn't. You say, that's a, that makes sense. God can 
even when he doesn't, do you still believe that he can? That's the highest level of faith. It's higher than any of the other levels. That God is able to do these things, but even when I ask and He doesn't deliver, even when I ask and He doesn't answer my prayer the way I have, it doesn't mean that I don't still believe that God is able and God can. Hebrews 11 has those people we talk about as the end of the page talks about the others. Others who, who trusted God and were thrown to the lion's den, who hid in caves, who were tortured and killed, and others who, who didn't receive, it says, the promise that God had made to them. And you say, but I thought faith was going to give me everything that I want. No, 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 no. In the first part of the passage, it talks about the fact that God did all those things for, for all those great heroes of the faith in the past. He did them for them. But then for some, He did not. And we say, why not? God's not fair if he gives to some and not to other people. God is being God when he does that, and he's allowed to give to who he wants to give. It's his perfect will and plan. But when people like those of the others who didn't get what they said they were going to get or thought they were promised to get, didn't get it, they still believed that God was able and is still able. I need you to believe this, people. How that we can know, and it says in verse 40 of Hebrews 11, and the reason they knew this was because they understood that God had planned something better for them. So when you don't get what you believe God has promised, or we don't, you don't get the answer to the asks and the imaginings that you have, don't be worried, because God has planned something better. The best is yet to come even when he doesn't answer as you want him to answer, even when he doesn't deliver what you hope he will, he is still able to do it. That's the highest level of faith. There's one last word here in the passage, and it's the word amen. Amen. God is able to do immediately above what you either ask or imagine. Amen. Amen. You know what amen means? So let it be. So if I had a one sermon or a one word sermon for you this 2024, it would be amen. Let it be. Let everything that I've spoken to you about today, let it be amen. Amen to all of you who want to trust God more. Amen to all of you who want to do what the sermon has just told you, that God is able to do above what you ask or imagine. Amen to that. I hope and I pray that that amen will be your experience this 2024. Helena and I wish you the, the happiest of years. Going to be some challenges, I'm sure. Stick together, people. Don't drift away. And it's your challenge. And let's live this thing out with amen. Let me just pray. Father, thank you for today and for the opportunity just to be able to share about this incredible passage. Thank you, God, for the, the wonder of doxology, that we will find a great theology that excites us to think that, that, man, God is more. God is extravagant. He can do way beyond what we dream or ask. That's the God that we have. And, Lord, even when you don't do what we ask or what we, beyond what we can imagine, it doesn't matter because you're still God and we still trust you and we believe that you are able even when you don't. It's okay. You can be God in our life. Help us, Lord, to take the sermon into this coming year and to live it every day to your honor and to your glory. Amen.